Yeah. Hey, hey yeah. guys, here we are down at uh, Hops and Growlers in Ocean Springs with our local bartender, <laughs> Mr. Scott. <laughs> And, and he's got, got some, some fine drinks selected for us. Scott, take us through the run. What are you, you serving us today? Well, I, what I did was I just went ahead and poured you some stuff I thought you guys would like. This is a little little drink named after Jordan. It's called Hipster Water. Uh -oh. uh, a little green apple, slightly sour seltzer for those guys that are hip. This is Jamaican Me Crazy, which is a coffee stout with blue Mountain Jamaican coffee, aged right in, in a rum right barrel <laughs> yeah, yeah. with cacao nibs and Madagascar vanilla beans. This right here is a creek, and a creek is a cherry sour, and uh, it's this one comes off our our Solera, and it's aged on cherries for two years. And then this one right here is a wee heavy, and that's a, a larger beer that's made to drink like a um, uh, malty, but yet light enough with big ABV. So it's something fun, but not what I would suggest everybody drink every day. No. Let's pick rock, scissors for that. Yeah, yeah. all right, ready? Okay. One, two, three, shoot. Yeah. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. One, two, three, shoot. <laughs> One, two, three, shoot. <laughs> it's mine. All right. I'll go with this one. All right, all right. I'm gonna try these. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, he's got, got more. Oh, well, cheers to it. Yeah, we will. All right, so give us the backstory on this right here. Where did you come up with well, this, one? this individual one right here? Well, mm. what I happened? I get a, a a lot of barrels from uh, Jonathan Masano okay. over over at Masano's, and uh, Jonathan will hand pick barrels and stuff like that. And then I'll supplement some of those barrels with whether it's a port or a Chardonnay or a rum or a tequila barrel. And I keep all those in my cooler and I um, lager different beers in them. So right now we have um, three different beers lagering really? in the cooler that are gonna be coming out over the next few months and that'll be the Masano series. And I needed to get one of the other barrels moved out of there, which was the rum barrel, which this beer has been aging for quite a while on it. This and is absolutely, I mean, it's, yeah. It, that coffee's just right, not overkill. You know, yeah. not like. What's, what's the percentage, percentage of alcohol in this? Uh, 9.5. So it's a bigger beer. But I mean, wouldn't suggest drinking it all day, but. Oh, um, yeah. And I'll tell a lot of my friends that when we, like when they come in here and experience, you go with the heavier beers, but it's kind of like, having a, a whiskey like a whiskey you know like oh small absolutely and just you know sip on it enjoy it because it is a heavy beer but yeah you, you get that feel that's what you're talking about man it's you get that feel like you had a glass of whiskey no right. i I've, I've been very fortunate because of the fact that uh jonathan has uh let me embrace some of those barrels that he hand selects and so i have quite a few of those that will have beers rolling off in the next few months um, and I feel very fortunate that he's trusted me with those because I know he takes a lot of time in doing that. And so what we try to do is make sure the beer is perfect before it even goes in the barrel and it hits all the notes that we're looking for and then it accents the notes of the barrel. Um, with that one being a particular rum barrel, uh, we were actually able to get that right after it came off the boats in Miami and it was shipped directly to us. What a lot of people don't understand is when those rum barrels come in, they originally started as like Jack Daniels barrels. And then, and so then the rum distilleries buy them from Jack Daniels and then they use them and then they come back. I've heard and, that they swap the barrels. Yeah, out and so, and stuff like so that oh yes. So we get this beautiful barrel and of course it's still got a little liquid floating around in it. And we get it in here and we prep it. And it takes quite a bit of prep time to get those barrels ready, but then we get it into circulation. And so we'll get a use one to two times out of a barrel for beer. And then it becomes a neutral barrel where you're not picking up the flavors and the accents that you want. So is that typical like every time two, two uses and then you're done? Or? It, it, it is except you're some not like of, a go to barrel. I, I do have a couple go to special barrels and uh, I would I would be a liar not to say that these barrels are magnificent. Uh, a lot of times they're French oak. Um, they were either a cognac barrel or a French Chardonnay. And the, those barrels harbor quite a few special bugs, as we call it in the industry, which are the different yeasts. And um, 
we we are very fortunate that we have a barrel from 1993 that um, there's a, a special bottle of uh, yeast that went into that from uh, Cantillon. Uh, we have some other uh, beautiful barrels of French oak, port barrel, tequila barrel, rum barrels. Um, we have two Russell barrels back there that Jonathan just uh, put in my hands not too long back. We have four roses barrels. I mean, so we've been very fortunate with four our barrels. Roses barrel. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a different taste. Uh, you know, what's great about Jonathan being so close and, and, and of course helping me out is that I get to live on that journey with him a little bit longer and I get to take it one more step. So it's, I feel very fortunate about that relationship that we've built and, uh, and I don't want to let him down either. Yeah, so. yeah cause he, he don't, he, he does travel. So he really takes yes. it serious and he goes, he goes a different, uh, distilleries. he just, he just got back off a trip where he went up for a week and hand tested several barrels and hand selected certain barrels. So he's out of the circuit. Yeah, that's where I get my, yes. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. single barrels, like the number, like uh, my bourbons, like when there's a number one, you'll see like a little Mazzano patch on it. He goes out, signs a barrel, Right. Does the whole experience, tastes the barrel, they, pl they plug it, yep. or, and then he gets a little taste, and then he gets it, gets a bottle, gets the barrel, and that's when Scott takes it and recreates. Yeah, when Jonathan gets these big shipments in, and he's really good about using social media or letting his better customers know this, that he's about to get something in, he'll, he'll also let me know, hey, Scott, I'm about to get this barrel in, should still be wet. That's the key to most barrels, especially when you're taking a bourbon barrel a rum barrel or a scotch barrel, you really want that barrel to be still wet. And what I mean is still have a little bit of liquid in there not to be dried out. Gotcha. Because um, once you start curing those barrels, over time, they're gonna lose that taste, that flavor profile. So you and, fill the barrel all the way up? Yes. The gear to, yes. To the rim? Yeah, it overfills when we fill. Um, um, the barrel's gonna absorb a little bit. You're gonna lose a little bit. Um, we, we um, section our barrels off into different areas of this building. It's a very small building, but we're able to use our cooler as a place to lager barrel fills, which we keep three to four barrels in there at a time going. And then we also use this front area where we keep at least eight to 10 barrels going for our sour beer. So that way we're not intermingling them. Got a little system going. Yeah. How often do you pick a new beer or do you go with the same brew over and over? Or, or? We brew once to twice a week and it really depends on demand and um, seasonality, what kind of fruit is in season, uh, what, what special grains I can get in, what type of yeast I can get in. Um, hops are a big deal. I mean, I mean, I can tell you when Galaxy Hops from Australia uh, were shipped into the United States. I paid $30 a pound, but I got fresh Galaxy Hops from Australia. That's just a beautiful grapefruity kind of flavor. It's taking it into a whole new beer. Yeah. For, it's, me. for a guy like me, that's only <laughs> drinking. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's, it's a lot of fun because you can really geek out over it, but when it gets down to it, it's basically water, yeast, hops, grain. I mean, it's pretty. Like you said earlier, y'all want to turn the yeast into, into sugar, right? That's yeah. What sugar well, what we're like. trying to do is we're trying to break open that malted barley mm -hmm. and expose the endosperm that's been malted into there. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to convert those starches that are within the grain into sugars. And so it's that's the mashing period, uh, time period. And then we have the sparging time period, which is basically you're rinsing it and moving it over to your boil kettle. You're also setting your grain bed so that you can use the grain bed as its own filter so that you don't bring a lot of particulates over to your um, boil kettle. Um, and then boil kettle is where a lot of the finished work is done. That's where your hops are added. That's where you're getting your ABV where you want it to be. And then you cool it and move it over to your fermenter. Which one of these is which? I'm going to try one, another one. I forgot which one is the well, on, uh, on the, Here, try this one. Right. I got a question on your, your process. And you just said you fill all the barrels up. I mean, do you do any kind of like smaller tests to... With little oh, small like batches. Well, I, I, to be, your ideas, you know? well, to be totally honest with you, I've been doing this for close to 20 years now. 
And so I have every book, every recipe I've ever even tried uh -huh. and I make notes in in those recipes. So I, I pretty much when it comes to the grain bill, it, not everything's going to be like championship quality uh, um, uh, just because some of the product you can't get it at certain times. But what we try to do is we try to follow those recipes that we've had a lot of great success with. And we, we pretty much stay on that. So it's real, I don't want to say it's easy for me, but it has become easy. Now it's more about a set of recipes. It's more about caring for the yeast, making sure the yeast is healthy. Because if the yeast is healthy, then the wort that you've made from that grain it's going to ferment out and it's going to be healthy. And so what we we'll, what we try to do is create an environment where we can be successful in that process. And there's certain steps to this. When you get into the barrel aged sours, it goes through a second fermentation. So it's already been fermented in our fermenters. And then at a certain point, we stop the fermentation to transfer it into our barrels so where it can finish its last step of the fermentation. And so it's pretty complicated from a standpoint. If you've never done it, it would be hard to follow. But we, we have a, a, a Solera, a Golden Solera, for instance, that we've been going for about four and a half, five years now. And so it's just, it's just really hitting its stride. And then with the Solera, you can add different grains. If you're not liking the direction you're you going, manipulate yeah, it. Yeah, that's, and that's you really can cool. pull from that oh. batch and you can, as you pull from that batch, you may see a characteristic that you don't really care for, or you want to emphasize a certain characteristic that it has. And then you change your wart that goes back in that barrel. So it's constantly evolving and constantly changing. And that's the way we've tried to approach our sour program is we want to be, have a more involved. We don't want to just put beer in a barrel and then pull beer out and say, we're done. We want to oh, be involved. Story. Yeah, and so, like I said, we have a 93 Cantillon yeast, okay? We have a yeast that I've cultivated for 10 years and now is part of that Golden Solera that I told you about. We have other different styles of yeast in each of those barrels, whether it's the tequila barrels or the port barrels or the Chardonnay barrels. And, and all that takes monitoring because wow. you said only well, yes, some yeah. of it's only available certain times yeah. of year. So you yeah. Gotta... Well, with those bugs and or yeast, we have kept those going for years. So we, we know their health. We know their health, and as we feed it, as we pull beer from those barrels, we go back before it gets more than halfway down, and we refeed it. Okay. We taste barrels once a month. We pull out little cups, like For taster cups, and we take a wine thief, and we taste every one of those barrels. And I might have three or four people here tasting barrels. Yeah, you have to after drinking one of these. Yeah, well, we're tasting. We're not drinking. <laughs> we're tasting. And so what we, we we can do at that point is we can determine, wow, I, I, I really like this. I get a lot on the nose. I'm not getting enough in the mouth. I need to let that go a little bit longer. Okay. Or... I want a little more mouthfeel, so I want to add oats or wheat to the next batch so that I can get a little more mouthfeel. Or I want to raise maybe the mash temperature so I can get a little more body. So is and, this you making these decisions oh, here yeah, at yeah. Hops and Growlers, or do you yeah. got a team that's giving you these well, pointers? Or I, I mean, you always you encourage input, yeah, you, you know, know because, you know, my palate likes what my palate likes, and everybody's palate's different. That's what's, what's your great. Good what's your favorite? Uh, you know what? It's my next beer. I mean, I that's hate to awesome. say it that's like awesome. that. Yeah, that's that's, what is this from here again? Uh, you know, I don't even remember. <laughs> that smells like an alt. Maybe I poured the wrong thing. That smells. So that's that's the wee heavy. That's the alt beer. I think. I think it's somehow I got you all yeah. messed up. I don't know. It tastes delicious. So how many of them do you actually have on tap? Well, what time? we do right now, well, currently we're running uh, about 22. That's crazy. And gonna... people go, well, you're so small. How can you do that? And, that, and I, ha I always tell them it's easier for me to do 22 than it is a large brewery to do you know, six or seven or yeah, eight because, because 
I'm brewing on a much spaces. smaller batch. I'm brewing to about a three barrel, which is about 90 gallons, 70 to 90 gallons on each batch. So I have the flexibility of changing things more often than they do. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is really good. Any aspirations of putting anything into it other bars or? No. Mm-mm. No, you to come here we, to get it. Uh, heard that, folks. You got to come here to get we, this stuff. <laughs> we we made the decision early on that that um, we wanted to do this so that I had a place that I could touch every bit of the process, that I could spend time with my friends, where it's a comfortable environment. We wanted a pub environment where we made the beer and we were in part of every part of the process. I think you got that. Well, well, once you start allowing other people to serve your beer, are they going to look after it? Are they going to make sure they hold the temperature? Are they going to move it out of cycle? probably not. You're right. You already know the answers to those questions. I got a question that um, I've been on you for a few years. Like, what got you into entering your brews and tournaments and uh, competitions? I, I had a really good friend. It, this is this is a, a, a short story, but I'm gonna make it long. No, I'm just joking. But uh, no, I had a really good friend that told me I was brewing. He was brewing. Um, I had said something to him like, "Man, I just don't know how good my beer is." And he goes, "Oh, your beer's great, dude." And I was like, "Nah, nah I mean that's all good. When you're giving free beer away, everybody it's thinks great. it's good, you know." Yeah. So he kept encouraging me to enter competitions. So I started entering competitions more and more, and we won a couple little small regional Mississippi, Louisiana competitions, Alabama competitions. And then I was like, yeah, I might be okay for around here. I can hold my own, you know, I can make decent beer. I said, he goes, well, why don't you enter nationals? And I said, well, what's nationals? He says, there's the biggest beer competition in the world that happens every year. I said, what? He goes, yeah, there's because, and now I've been, now get this, I've been brewing for quite a while at this point. It's like a Super Bowl of beer. I never knew about this. So he says, yeah, that's what you need to do. You need to enter nationals. Now I've, I had entered competitions in Houston, Oregon, all over the United States, but I never really knew about nationals. So I started, you know, I found out that they were gonna have an entry um, opening here real soon for you qualify through a regional and then, I was wondering if it was uh, like a qualifying yeah, round. You have to qualify and then from that qualifier Which you get to um, you get to enter it into the finals. So me and him entered. Um, I was very fortunate that I had two beers get through the regional um, semifinals is what they call them and move on to nationals. How did you get to enter? Uh, four. So I felt pretty good about it. And um, I had me and a couple, there was a couple other guys from Mississippi that went up and it was, uh, the nationals were actually held in Grand Rapids that year, Michigan. So I would always wanted to see the beer scene there anyway. So me and a a couple other buddies, uh, Craig Hendry, uh, Mark Cowley, uh, we all went up and and went to this big competition. There was about 8,000 something beers in the competition. I wasn't really expecting a lot. And um, I was shocked. When uh, I won a gold medal that year. Really? What? Yeah, the first national competition. So that's the are. You got gold medal <laughs> beer here. Well, I mean, you I, guys need to come try this stuff out. I, I was, a lot of these competitions, I've been very fortunate. And I just, you know, it's it's really, sometimes it's where the beer is in the selection process. Well, I know the two um, I've had so far would probably win a medal. <laughs> yeah. Better than Bud Light, I'll and tell that, you that. And I will tell you too, guys, it's another thing to do is, if it's not up to par, I've, I stop in. He's always said sixty gallons gets gets poured, uh, seventy gallons gets poured. It's for him. It, his beer. It's it's his passion. It's you know, and he wants you to experience the same thing. And that's why I appreciate hops and growlers. I don't know much about beer. I came in here and I always thought Scott's is kind of you'll like this. And and I've always kind of dived into what I did stouts, which I was really into stouts, and then we moved to IPAs. But the experience that Scott gives you is very it's. To well, me, it's important. I, I appreciate that, Jordan. Um, the reason could I have sold some of those beers? I probably could have. Um, in hindsight, you know, mm-hmm. let, let's just us talking. No. But I'll make that decision every time because if it's not what I want, and I couldn't, in good conscience, sit across from a friend of mine and give him that beer and be proud of it, then I don't want to serve it. 
And so that's why I throw it out. I'm like my career too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the this is like my second career. I'm very fortunate to be able to do what I'm doing and do what I love to do and be able to do it every day and go home feeling good about what I've accomplished. We're doing it well in my book. You get an A plus from me. <laughs> well, I don't know if I always do it well, but I try. So, so oh. let's say on the creative side, though, where you, uh, you know, after you shut down your place, where's your, where are these ideas of like the, the, the ideas in your little book that you write? I mean, you, are you laying in bed and you just, this would sound like a good, you know, beer and then you would really just. Well, I, I, <sighs> To be How's honest, it comes to the cover. brain. They, well, look, yeah, right, I mean, right. you're, you're adding about all the different you, you ingredients. You may not want to get in there after you're yeah, mine's, scary. <laughs> mine's a scary place, too. I mean, there's some shadows. Um, I live out in the country. Okay, I live out. We, we're very fortunate. We have a, a place that has a bunch of acreage, um, and it's a very rural area of, of the coast. And... Um, one of my most favorite things is to take my old truck, roll down the windows, especially right after a rain, and drive around. And I'm not, I'm not talking about drinking or getting crazy. Yeah, I hope not. Or, so or, or, you know, what I'm saying is I like that because I get all these smells. I get all these pictures going through my head of what I imagine. So one day... I'll give you a fine example. A Taste of Mississippi. A Taste of Mississippi is a beer that we make that is a very small beer. And when I say small beer, what I mean is it's very low in ABV. So it comes in around 3.4%. Okay. What originally gave me the thought for that beer was one of those drives. I was driving around. It was early spring. It had just rained. I was going the back roads. I had the radio up, probably a little too loud. And I went, wow, what is that? I actually stopped my truck. I get out. And I see this big old gardenia bush. And I hadn't seen gardenias since my grandmother's house. And she used to have one. And I went, wow. And then I said, I could smell the earth from the rain, you know, when you get that smell of earth. And then I smelt a little sweetness in the air as well. And it was like honeysuckle. So I went, man, if I could just make a beer that tastes like that, that would make me happy. And so I started thinking about it. And I said, well, let me find out about gardenias. Found out they're not poisonous. Edible. The flowers are great. So I even found recipes where people were using it to make wine. So then I took a I wanted a small beer. I wanted it to be light and dainty with a hint of gardenias. And so then I said, man, what's more Mississippi than muscadines? So I went and I picked tons of muscadines that fall, froze them. So I put this together from spring to fall. And then finally, the wow, finally <laughs> I, I had it all together in my head what it was going to taste like and what it was going to be like. And so I, I made the beer. What's it called? Taste of Mississippi. Taste of Mississippi. And so. And that, that's, a, that, that's from how, a ride. That's inspiring. That's you know, but, really. but, but like, um, that's crazy. You man. got the beat. You got the beat. Yeah. Who makes beer it. with beat? Okay. So I'm going through the grocery store and my wife looks at it and she looks at this little container of sushi. And when they make sushi, what they'll do is they'll, yeah, and... the little the little ginger that's in there. The reason it's pink is because they use they used to put beet juice in there, and it would stain it pink, and it looked a little better than the the light yellow and brown uh, slices of ginger. So they take that and they dip it and or leave it in beet juice. And she goes, "Oh, I never knew that." I said, "Yeah, I bet you that'd make a really good beer." And that's where that inspiration kind came from. our show was taking place. Right yeah. now. Like, I bet that would be really cool to it, take the camera. Yeah. yeah, and so I, I, that's how that came about. I said, now what would a beet and ginger beer taste like? And then I said, well, that should be a sour. No doubt. It's got, it's earthy. It's, it's light. Uh, the ginger is going to give it a little pop or a little zest. So 
He's more. He's a chef. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, art. I, I, I mean, it, you, you got, got any in good a, fall uh, beers coming <laughs> for all the basic white girls out there? Yeah. We'll have pumpkin spice. So I true. Know. That's the best line ever. We'll um, we'll have plenty of pumpkin spice. Oh, uh, that, that's what you get at Hops and Growlers, and I think that was a, a big thing. Is I have no idea. Like I, I'm not a craft guy. I think we joke about. Uh, I have one of them Growlers. Mom got got me. You know, it's. Yep. Um, Brower works, Saul's stainless and stuff. So people think I know everything about beer. I don't, but We're figuring it out. His, yeah, and his passion for beer is like, you look at it differently. Like it's, he, when he, he eats, sleeps, drinks, it's, it's a family thing, family owned. And it's just one of the things that you just, you take pride in. And uh, I mean, best beers I've ever had are here. And yeah, I can take a second time. I, he's not a big, he's not a beer guy. And then you do to goes. Tell tell us about the to goes and the and the actual well, growlers because I know well, I've came and got a couple filled up. Yeah, that's it. that's part of our name, um, hops and growlers. And a growler is uh, nothing more than a a container to put beer in. So um, a milk jug would just yeah, well, do. actually <laughs> yes and no. I mean, there's a couple things you need on there: Surgeon General warning. Uh, you need to be able to label it and and everything, but. Um, no, that's one way we do. We also make, we also put together cans. So we have a crowler machine that we utilize and um, we do 16 ounce crowlers. The whole reason I bought this machine was there were certain beers that were either one, too high in ABV, or there were beers that we had such a limited amount. Um, some, a lot of our barrel aged sours, we have such a limited amount of that, that we didn't want, we wanted more people to experience. So. And I kept coming up against this wall. Well, I just want one growler. I just want one growler. And so what we decided was, I was looking into growler machines and I said, you know what? On those beers that we're not giving growler fills of, why don't we get the growler machine in 16 ounce form? That way somebody can still take it to go and enjoy it but yet it, it leaves enough so that more and more people could try, try it. Yeah, because we, that's what we really want. Okay, I could, sure, could I sell it? Oh yes, I could. I could sell every bit of it. I could sell it in 64 ounces, but, it, but then less people get to try it. And, right. and the whole goal with this was, okay, let's give them something that they can, get. Maybe, maybe their husband or wife or, or a significant other couldn't make it out with them today and they want to take something special home. I understand. So that's why we added this, and uh, it, it it's been great. Um, it's it's uh, never any problems. It gives we we label them, we send them out, and and um, you, you can take it to the beach. You can take it on the boat. You can take it camping. That's what's up. And so For that sure. always helps too. Well, I mean, I feel like oh, this has been a great. Yeah, uh, come get your cans. Yeah. And your growlers filled at Hans and Growlers. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Scott. Appreciate you guys. Cheers. Always good to see you guys. Yeah. Thanks, brother. <laughs>